One of my favorite things was diving the SDB off the back of a submarine in the middle of the ocean, right? Uh, and, and, and knowing that that submarine is there in that spot, right there, right then, to support you and you only, as far as you being the team, right? The element on that SDB. And then when you pull that SDB off the back of the submarine, and you look down and you know that there is thousands and thousands and thousands of feet of water below you and you have no idea what's below you. That is uh, one of my favorite things. Welcome to Combat Story. I'm Ryan Fugit and I serve war zone tours as an army attack helicopter pilot and CIA officer over a 15 year career. I'm fascinated by the experiences of the elite in combat. On this show, I interview some of the best to understand what combat felt like on their front lines. This is Combat Story. Today we hear the combat story of John McCaskill, a Navy SEAL commander turned mindfulness and meditation teacher. He spent a career in the Navy's special warfare and military's joint special operations communities and served in Iraq, Afghanistan, off the coast of Somalia, and in Panama. One story that John shares and which shows the burdens and gut-wrenching aspects of combat was his association with Operation Red Wings, which many will recall from the book and movie Lone Survivor. John is a Naval Academy graduate, holds a master's degree from the Naval Postgrad School, and since retiring, runs a consulting business that brings mindfulness and meditation to high-performing teams to aid in dealing with stress, anxiety, and depression, all while increasing focus, creativity, and productivity. He shares the benefits and opportunities both on this show and on his own podcast called Men Talking Mindfulness, which, as John described it, is what happens when you combine a Navy SEAL and a modern-day hippie. I hope you enjoy John's honest, humble, and challenging combat story as much as I did. John, thanks a lot for taking the time to share your story today. My pleasure, Ryan. Thanks for having me. So like many, like many SEALs, I think you, uh, you make every one of us look really lazy when you get out of the service. You got your hands in several, several, uh, different efforts that we will get to here, um, whether it's it's mindfulness, it's uh, consulting, um, it's nonprofit work, it's, it's very inspiring. And on top of all that, the family and the life that you led as a SEAL. Uh, and as we get into that, I just wanted to start with, as a kid, did you also have this kind of polymath upbringing? Uh, did you have a lot of irons and many fires? Like what was John as a kid like in that regard? Yeah, um, I've never really thought about it until you asked that question. But yeah, I, I did. Uh, you know, uh, I, I was a runner growing up. I, at first, I, I started with uh, baseball. Here, uh, actually, I got to backtrack a little bit before I fully answer that question. I was I was born in South Africa, and in South Africa, cricket and soccer were my thing. Uh, and I was, you know, until I was seven years old moved to the States thinking that I was going to play cricket here. And <laughs> I don't even remember the rules of cricket now, but I, I went from cricket into baseball. <clears throat> it was somewhat of a, a natural progression. Um, played, played baseball, like the, you know, the young years and was involved in other, like other activities at school, uh, the, the various clubs and things. And then when I got into high school, <clears throat> I started, I cut out baseball, cut out football, cut out basketball and, and started focusing on the running as far as athletics. But um, then I was also involved in, you know, future business leaders of America and, uh, you know, all the other, other extracurricular activities you can be part of in school. Uh, I was, I was a, a musician. I played the trombone. Uh, I, I was not in the marching band for very long. I, I, I wasn't, I wasn't a fan of the marching piece. Yeah. <laughs> I just couldn't, I couldn't get that piece down. And then the ironic part is I joined the military of course, and yeah. doing a lot of marching. <laughs> so um, anyhow, so I was involved in a lot of things um, and then, and then joined the the Navy and, uh, and even within the Navy, I was involved in uh, a lot of uh I guess, for lack of a better term, extracurricular activities, and now, uh, and now I am again got a couple Same of irons thing. and a couple of different fires. Yeah, I guess it's just part of my DNA. Staying busy is uh, is fun, but I try to I try to still make time for myself and and for my family, so that the busyness, uh, or rather, the business doesn't become busyness. Um, so I, I try to just focus on on that. Yeah. So I. I got to jump back to the South Africa piece. I don't think I had mentioned this to you. I grew up in Zimbabwe. Oh, no um, way. So, uh, but we didn't play cricket. We played rugby and oh, yeah. soccer. So when I yeah. came back, I couldn't, like, I came back probably when I was 
12 or 13 and I could not hit a curveball to save my life. Like I just couldn't <laughs> hit one, you know, like you don't grow up playing yeah. that yeah. sport. It's hard, but I, I transitioned into football instead, which obviously has a lot of connections with, with rugby. So with that's, rugby, that is sure. really interesting, man. Um, Hey, I, you mentioned that you kind of dropped these other sports and went, went into running exclusively. What was the decision for that? <laughs> I would love to say that it was because I was just this amazing runner. Uh, and I, I was decent at running, but I was, <laughs> I, I hit a growth spurt. Um, you know, I, I was somewhat tall for my age, most of my life. And then, uh, you know, somewhere around middle school, I, I hit a pretty good growth spurt. And with that, my coordination went out the window. So like all ball, ball sports <laughs> fell by the wayside, like anything that I had to catch or throw a ball. Um, I, I'm still pretty, pretty lacking in, in the coordination area, but yeah, uh, I was a, I was a better runner than I was a football player, basketball player, or baseball player. And that's, uh, and that's where I found my enjoyment and kind of found my tribe. And funny enough, that laid the foundation for what I ended up doing later. It was, you know, the running, the track team and the cross country team were very small. I grew up in Ruston, Louisiana, a small town in, in the North central part of the state. And, uh, even though we were very small, we were very good. We had an amazing coach, almost like my second dad. And we did absolutely everything together. That, that team, it's like eight or nine guys did like absolutely everything together. And I realized I wanted to be part of something like that. When I left high school, I wanted to be part of a very small tight knit group that was somewhat elite. And that's how I kind of fell upon special operations. So yeah. lay the foundation. Wow. He, what was your dad or your parents doing in South Africa? Just quickly before we move on from that, because now I'm yeah. very curious here. Yeah, it's a, a question I get quite often, but funny enough, uh, they were born and raised there, actually go back several generations on both sides. Um, so uh, yeah, my my parents, my father's side uh, goes back to Scottish lineage and my mother's goes back to a Welsh lineage, wow. but, but they were born and raised there. Their parents were born and raised there. So uh, they actually left South Africa with me and four other kids. I have three older sisters and a younger brother. Uh, one of the reasons they left was apartheid. Uh, obviously, uh, they, they didn't agree with that. But also, they, they wanted to avoid conscription for myself and my brother, because that was still a thing in South Africa then. And so the joke with my dad now is, is that we left, a, we left South Africa to avoid conscription. And I came over here and voluntarily joined the United States military. Backfire. All right. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Um, when, when you mentioned that this kind of lots of extracurriculars being in the DNA, did you see that in your parents? Was that like kind of a way you were raised to just be pretty active or was that something you sought out on your own? Uh, you know, my parents were, uh, my parents are still uh, still with us and they were I, I don't think they were involved in a whole lot of things so, i mean my father was an architect and he was a cyclist and he still does he dabbles in architecture he designed the house that they live in um designed you know a whole lot of buildings through his time as an active architect uh, still dabbles in that um still cycles he's uh, turning 80 Either this year or next year, I'm pretty bad. I'm embarrassed that I don't know that, but it's it's coming up. Yep. And uh, and he's still, I mean, he's on his bike all the time, and he's got my mother into cycling as well. But I, I wouldn't say that it was uh, something where they were doing a whole lot of things. Uh, I, I don't know honestly where I got that bug. I, yeah. I think it it came came to me from from a, a young age, it, it, probably friends or uh, you know teachers that that inspired me, and and uh, I've always just been uh been wanting to do a whole lot of things it's, it's tough though i mean I, funny enough i say i'm doing a whole lot of things i've got the one thing book sitting right here uh and uh you know they talk to, they talk about focusing on one thing yeah. and i do when i'm when i'm doing one thing that is the one thing i'm focused on or at least i try to as best i can and uh and i've found that in doing the one thing at a time, I'm able to do a lot more, if that makes sense, yeah. uh, rather than trying to multitask and failing at a whole lot of things. Yeah. So you can actually do a few things just one at a time as you're taking exactly. it on. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And you described kind of this finding your tribe, moving, helping you find your way into special operations was that there are certainly other tribes out there that, you know, that you could join with, with sports or music or just business. Um, what was the 
the itch for you? Was it always, Hey, I want to be a seal. Was it, I just want to be in special ops, the military, like where did that bug come from? Uh, I mean, <laughs> uh, I think uh, it's a combination of a few things. One, I, I think I have just a, um, a heart of service. And I mean, I don't mean to sound trite or braggadocious in saying that, but I, I always wanted to serve my fellow man. Um, and, and then, uh, <laughs> and then another side of it is there was a, a little bit of me that had an ego um, and, and also an adventure seeking side. So I think the, you know, the special operations, I saw them as up here and I said, you know what, I'm going to challenge myself and, and try to do that. And, uh, and then I also saw what they did for a living and, uh, you, you know, it seemed pretty cool. So I, I wanted to, I wanted to jump out of airplanes. I wanted to run around carrying heavy weapons and, uh, and then being in fast boats. So the, the SEAL community definitely uh, jumped out at me. But I would also be lying if I, I didn't say that some movies kind of in the way they glamorize yep. the job uh, didn't skew my <laughs> skew my yeah. perception of special operations. I, I remember, uh, you know, watching The Rock uh, yeah. so back good. in the day. Yeah. yeah. When the when, you know, when the seals come up in the shower room. The uh, during, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was like, oh, that's that's a pretty cool job. Uh, whatever that is. <laughs> let me let me look into that. So uh, I got to be honest, it, it did. Uh, it did kind of influence my my perspective and my ultimate decision to go into the into the seals man and then as you mentioned you know with your with your old man or your, both your parents like leaving an entire country and uprooting you to avoid conscription what, what was the discussion like when when they learned what you were doing or was it just hey they knew you were going that direction for some time yeah um so i i was 18 august before my senior year in high school and uh, I was talking to a recruiter, uh, a buddy of mine who was actually a couple of years ahead of me in, in high school had had gone into the Navy and he had talked me into potentially going that way. So I went and talked to a recruiter. And now because I'm 18, I could sign the paperwork myself. And I made that decision. I, I remember signing that paperwork to to enlist in the, the delayed enlistment program, the DEP. And I went home and I told my dad, I was like, yeah, I, I signed up for the Navy. And he's like, Oh, you've made a huge mistake. We're going to get you out of that. There's no way. There's no way my wow. son is going to serve in the Navy. Wow. <laughs> uh, now, looking back on it, you know, we laugh at it. And, and he's very proud of, of what I did, how of I course. served um, and, and everything else. But yeah, that conversation initially didn't go very well. Um, it was He was not happy with that decision. And, uh, and then I, I you know, was in the delayed enlistment pro program for a whole year. What, you know, my senior year in, in school, you don't really do anything. It's just, it's just saying that you're a part of this program, basically committing before you graduate high school. And, uh, and then, then I left for boot camp. and <laughs> the first couple of days of boot camp, I was like, Oh, I think my dad was right. I've, I've made a huge mistake, <laughs> but again, looking back on it, it was, it was a good step. So it's interesting. He, he didn't, convince you otherwise like you're pretty set on doing this it sounds like how, oh, yeah. how hard was that discussion with your old man yeah uh, i mean i think he's always known that i've i'm my own person that i'm going to make a decision and, and uh i mean he's my hero or one of them and i very much look up to him but once i set my mind on something that's what i'm going to do and i think he knew that about me uh, although at the time i didn't tell him that I, I wanted to go into special operations i just told him that i wanted to go into the navy uh and i enlisted in the navy went to boot camp did that thing for did the whole enlisted side for uh, just shy of a year and then and then got picked up for the naval academy that whole time i still didn't tell him tell him or my mother that i wanted to go into the seal community did my time at the naval academy and then uh not until uh, about you know 3 years into the naval academy did i tell them that i was considering going into special warfare and then once I got picked up, <laughs> once I got picked up to go to, to Bud's, um, yeah, then I called them up. I was like, uh, just so you guys know, I'm not going to be a naval aviator or a ship driver. Not that there's anything against that. That's just not what I want to do. Uh, and I told them that I was going to go SEALs. And <laughs> yeah, that they were, uh, I don't know, a little, a, a little upset with me, um, but I think also proud of me at the same time. So, yeah. Man, that's not... It's not easy sticking to your guns with parents when you're that close and you admire them so much. Yeah, it's impressive. yeah, no, it's they they've been supportive. So you know, it wasn't ever they didn't have an iron fist and say, "Hey, you won't do this, you will do that, whatever." Uh, but the, they they voiced their concerns, I guess is the best way yeah, to put it, sure. and then and then supported me in my decision. Oh, 
And then I, I didn't realize that you did the the enlistment option first. But why not stay yeah. that course and go into the SEALs that way? What, <laughs> what was the yeah. decision there? So initially, I actually tried to get into the Naval Academy out of high school, got turned down. Um, I, I didn't have the grades, didn't have the the all the different courses that you needed. I had like basic calculus, but not, not anything as, as advanced as they did, they'd wanted me to have. And then uh, because I got turned down, I still wanted to go SEALs. So I enlisted in the Navy, um, did the delayed enlistment program thing, um, was a parachute rigger and, and enjoyed that work. But I think um, I, I was under the... Um, I, I was under the impression that you couldn't lead from the enlisted ranks, you couldn't lead like I wanted to lead from the enlisted ranks, which is completely not true. It was just, you know, I was 19 year old yeah. enlisted yeah. kid and didn't know the difference. I saw the officers uh, leading cause that's just who I saw. Uh, and, and I was like, you know what? I, I still want to be an officer looking back on it. There's definitely a split, split decision, like, uh, or split desire rather. There's a part of me that wishes that I had stayed enlisted, served as an uh, as an enlisted SEAL for uh, a long time, and then became an officer. Those guys have really the best of both worlds. They get to do the tactical level stuff. They get to lead on the battlefield at a you know at, 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 for a long time. And then um, the the other side of things is the the Naval Academy taught me a lot. I really enjoyed the Naval Academy. I, I have people that I really consider as brothers and sisters that I went through the Naval Academy with. Um, and, and then the network that comes with having been a, been an Academy grad. I mean, it, there's, it's not a bad network to be a part of. So there's definitely a part of me that wishes that I had stayed enlisted and done that, done that route. Um, if I had two lives to live, I would have done both. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, the decision I made and there's, there's definitely pros and cons to it. Yeah. Oh man, that's interesting. So if we, if we fast forward, then I, I'm not as familiar just since I was on the army side, like I, I didn't go to West Point, but I understand how they operate and what it's like there just from so many of the guys and girls I served with, um, at, at the Naval Academy, how, how difficult is it to branch into special warfare? Like, is that massively competitive or is it mainly like a lot of folks want to drive ships? A lot of guys want to be aviators. How does that work out? Yeah, it's it's pretty neat. Like you show up plebe year or freshman year, and that's you know that's about twelve hundred people or so that get inducted day one, right? And you know out of that, there's a, a percentage that is female, so you can kind of take them out at the time. Special warfare right. was not open to to females, so you take them out of the equation. So uh, I think that the cl our class was about thirty percent female, so you've got about seventy percent remaining. And of that, there's a there's a surprising amount of of men who say, "I want to be a SEAL day one, day one of the Naval Academy." Um, after we do plebe summer and uh, you know eight weeks nine weeks later you you ask the, the class and there's a significantly less number of people that want to be seals because now they've pushed themselves to a physical side that they hadn't ever touched before so they're, you know you know what um maybe the seals is not for me um and then you know as you progress through the the four years you start to identify the people who have the, the kind of the mentality of going into special warfare. Those, those who are at the gym a lot, those who are in the pool a lot, those who are, you know, running a lot, the, you, you kind of start to see one another in the gyms and you start to form this circle of, of, of guys that are working out together. And, and it's kind of a community almost in and of itself. Um, when I graduated in 2001 and for the years prior to, and several years after that, they were selecting 16 guys to go straight from the graduating class into BUDS, basic underwater demolition SEAL training. Um, after that, the, the Naval Academy had some really successful years and not because Naval Academy graduates are better, but because of kind of that community that I talked about, you already have a network as you go out to BUDS, you, you go to a class with three, four, five of your classmates from the Naval Academy that you've always worked out with and you have that support there in the BUDS class already. 
So the the Naval Academy had a very successful, a very high success rate of getting through buds relative to what the normal success rate is. So they ended up upping it. And I want to say last time I checked, it was like 30 something guys from each graduating class get selected to go out to buds wow. to subsequently become a SEAL. And, and they're doing well. The, the Academy classes are doing well. But yeah, um, there's still, there are there are many guys who want to be Marines. So the Marines, uh, the, the Naval Academy graduates Marines as well. At, at the time, it was one sixth of every class could go into the Marine Corps. I, it may have changed since then. I, I mean, my, my information is dated yeah. 2001. So 20 yeah. years dated. My my 20 year reunion is actually coming up, um, which I'm unfortunately not going to be able to go to. But oh. anyhow, uh, yeah. the bottom line is, you know, people could go there to be Marines. People do go there with aspirations to be surface warfare officers or ship drivers. People go there with, you know, the, the gleam in their eye from watching Top Gun and, and soon be watching Top Gun 2 or that's Maverick right. or whatever. <laughs> yep. and I'm yep. sure that's going to be another great surge for uh, wannabe naval aviators. But yeah, there's, there's definitely, there is a, a group, kind of a cohort that identifies one another uh, pretty quickly within the four years there. And uh, you spend a lot of time with one another. And you're I'm still tight with a lot of those guys. And one of 16 slots basically is what you're talking about. That is a right. massive filter that's put on. There. <laughs> it is. Jeez. Yeah. I mean, through the time there, you do. So um, you, you end up taking what's called a, you, or you go through a weekend. It's a long weekend called pre mini buds. And so you've got mini buds and then you've got pre mini buds. Pre mini buds is a weekend long where they actually fly some SEAL instructors out and then some upperclassmen uh, who are who are I don't know evil <laughs> probably uh, and they run you through a weekend basically basically like a weekend of hell week you run around with boats on your head the, the whole weekend you you get wet the whole weekend you're it is tough yeah I would say that that pre mini buds is as hard as any single day of buds. Wow. And then uh, uh, from the pre mini buds class, um, then they then they send guys out to mini buds, which is actually run out in Coronado, and uh, and then from that group they they kind of whittle it down and say, okay, these are the these are the people that are uh, el eligible to be one of those sixteen, and then they interview you. They they bring out some of the senior seals in the community to interview you. And, uh, and then run you through the physical tests and everything else. And then they rack and stack and say, okay, this is our, our 16 guys. And uh, I remember walking in, um, the way they do it is service selection, uh, or at least the way they used to do it. You would walk into your company officer's office. He would, the senior enlisted guy would close the door behind. And uh, the company officer had no idea. The company officer would open an envelope and wow. say, you know, Midshipman McCaskill, you are going, open the envelope and be like, to whatever. And, and, I, and I remember he said, he specifically said, you are going naval surface warfare and again, ship drivers, nothing against them, but that's not what I wanted to do. As a matter of fact, naval surface warfare was like fourth on my list. It was, it was a uh, Navy SEALs, Marine Corps ground, Marine Corps aviation, and then surface warfare. And I was like, uh, and he's like, oh, uh, I mean, special warfare. Oh, <laughs> so heart like, attack. Yeah, like I had a, I had this heart attack kind of disappointment and then just elation. And I ran out of his office and like all the all the uh, rest of the company mates are waiting to, to see what people get. And I like probably jumped higher than I've ever jumped in my life because I was so excited to go that way. And it was, it was really cool. Great moment. And then, uh, and then you kind of find out who else from that little group that you've been working out with yeah. for so long gets selected. And then, and then the tradition again, back then, it may not be still tradition. It may not be allowed was the Marines. They all shaved their heads. The, those, those who had selected Marines, they shaved their heads. Those who got se selected for special warfare shaved all the hair on their body. <laughs> so uh, whether you wanted to or not it was kind of an involuntary you, you either had it, you either did it or you had it done to you um so that you would know pretty quickly as you're walking around who had gotten selected you're like oh you have no eyebrows you have no oh, hair I didn't anywhere even think of that eyebrows yeah, yeah. Oh. eyebrows go beard like well you don't have a beard yeah, anyway but, sure. uh, uh, all the hair on your head um hair on your arms i mean you are slick <laughs> So it's pretty easy, pretty quickly to oh. tell who who else got selected. Um, so yeah, that's really good cool. Old days. <laughs> Is that to one up the Marines? Like they only do their heads. I'm sure so now we're going to do a full body. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> oh damn.
So if we, if we fast forward into buds, I know there's a lot of material out there on buds. People love hearing about it. Um, I, I'd love to just understand what it was like for you, especially with the path you're on now with mindfulness effect. Something about leadership came up there, but in particular, if there's anything about buds that you think people who haven't been don't quite understand, or maybe is portrayed inaccurately for the masses, I, I'd love to hear that because there's just <laughs> yeah. so much out there on it about the pain. But if there's anything there's, else that goes on that you think like, you know, people kind of get this wrong. Yeah, for sure. More like well, that. I'll say, um, you know, there's definitely, there's definitely a suck factor. Absolutely. There's no way, no getting around that. And that's, that's part of it. Um, but I, I would also say, you know, there's, there's a lot of fun, a lot of humor. Uh, I mean, I, I remember one of my yeah. classmates from the Naval Academy who, who ended up in, in my buds class as well. Um, he got donuts for the instructors, the instructors, you know, that do room inspections, they do uniform inspections. And he got this, uh, like 24 donuts, right. For all those instructors, instructors. And they're like, Hey, <laughs> we don't eat donuts. And then, so they made him eat all the donuts in front of the class as he, and as he's eating it, he's a, he's a monster. I love this guy. He's still a really good friend of mine, Mark Lantman. Um, as he's eating it, he's just laughing and we're all laughing at him. I think I, I want to say like we were in the push up position until he was finished with all the donuts. It was just hilarious. There's just some complete shenanigans that happen. And I remember, um, you know, we were out on the obstacle course one day and, and we're all lined up. You, you got to line up in height order or, or speed order, actually, for the obstacle course. You line up in speed order. So they send the fast guys out first, the slower guys towards the end, just so that the slow guys don't hold up the fast guys. Anyway, the instructors come out and they they roll up in their truck and they get on their megaphone and they're like, drop. So we drop down in the push-up position. And the one instructor's like, do you know why we dropped you? And I was like, because it's Tuesday. I mean, it's like completely random, right? Like there was no reason to drop us. We we're still, we we're doing exactly what we were supposed to do. We we're there on time. And, uh, and the instructors just busted out laughing because we had made some type of joke. And I remember another one, another part, sorry, I'm rambling a little no, bit. No, this here, is but perfect. I'm just man. This is exactly you know, what I'm, yeah. I'm thinking. So one of the instructors <clears throat> who I ended up running into later in the teams, um, he grabbed this dead fish that was on the beach. And, uh, and he was like, for some reason, I don't even know why he's just kind of a, a, a wacko. I love him, but he's a little bit of whack, wacko. He was just taking this big dead fish that he found on the beach and he was slinging it up in the air. It was going on, I don't know, like 20, 30 feet up in the air. And the third time he tosses it, it comes down and lands right on the windshield of one of the trucks that's following us around and shattered it. <laughs> and uh, and all the instructors are like they just stop what they're doing and then and then like the lead instructor there is like what the hell are you doing Lyman uh, th that's the guy's name and uh, you could just see suddenly there was this break in professional instructor and and, and complete shenanigans so like it was uh yeah there's I would say that's probably what you don't see a whole lot of yeah. is that there's a lot of fun a lot of shenanigans um and. Yeah, it's brutal, but looking back on it, I would do it all over again. As a matter of fact, <laughs> I have dreams that I'm doing it all over again a lot. A lot of the time, I'll get this dream where, you know, one of the instructors will come up to me like, hey, uh, Ensign McCaskill, you you didn't complete this requirement. You got to start all over, and I'm back in day one. I'm like, you guys realize I'm 44 years old, right? <laughs> I'm, not, not ready for I'm, not, I'm not the guy that I used to be. I don't know if I'm going to be able to finish this. And then, you know, I'll wake up, whatever. But yeah, it's it's a lot of fun to look back on. Um, and, uh, and there's definitely a level of camaraderie that is built amongst those that you make it through hell week with. And then later on through the second and third phases with, and then graduate with ultimately. I mean, I'm still good friends with some of the guys that I graduated with and I mean, we've lost some of our class as well to the combat losses. And and we all get together as a class and we celebrate those guys' lives that were part of our class that that made the ultimate ultimate sacrifice. So it's a it's a crucible like none other, I would say that. Yeah. God, what what was if you recall, what was the attrition for your class going through? I don't I don't remember the exact um numbers after Hell Week. Um like we started class uh, with 181 guys total, and after Hell Week, we we had some guys from the previous class roll into our class, mm -hmm. 
Um, we graduated, I want to say we graduated 24 total. So, and, and of that, we had like six, five or six rollbacks from the previous class. So we must have graduated Hell Week with uh, 18 or 19 guys, something like that. I may be off. I mean, at the end of Hell yeah, Week, no, your, your mind yeah. is a little <laughs> jacked up, Damn. but it was it was definitely something like that. I know we graduated with 24. God, that attrition is insane. I mean, just thinking back, like flight school is nothing like that. You feel like it's hard, but no, you're not losing that many people. Even right. at the agency, it's not like that, which is kind of a mind game, but you just don't lose 80% of a class. Yeah. The way. God. Well, it's, you know, I think a lot of people get into it for the wrong reasons. I mean, like I was talking yeah. about before I got into it uh, initially because I saw the rock and I was like, Hey, that's, that's a cool movie. And what they're doing is cool. But I, I honestly think there is a difference in some of the people who get through and some of those who don't. And I mean, I know plenty of amazing guys who did not get through and they're, they're no worse today than they were, you know, they're, they're amazing service members in some other uh, branch of the service, or I mean, uh, another branch of the Navy, um, or they are very successful businessmen, um, FBI agents, CIA uh, fathers, you know, they're no yeah. less of a man for having tried and, and not made it. And I don't want to, I don't even want to say failed because I don't think it's failed. I think it's, I think it's the kind of the, the proverbial man in the arena, right? Yeah. They, they tried and if they didn't try, they never would have known. Yeah. So they tried and they didn't make it. Um, but I will say that a lot of people do come in and they just want to say, I went to buds quote unquote, because there's even, even people who say I went to buds, I was at buds. There's, there's yeah. some kind of glamor, if you will, in that. Mm-hmm. But if you if you were to poll the class prior to, I've never done this, never I'm sure it won't ever get done. But if you were to ask them, why are you here? If somebody said, Hey, I want to be at Buds or I want to show it, I want to show that I can get through Buds, that's the wrong answer. That's the wrong mentality. The mentality is I want to be a SEAL. That's what you want to be. And this is just a stepping stone. And if you can realize that Buds is just this small little stepping stone in this much longer timeline of being a SEAL. I think those are the guys who typically make it because that mindset is so different. Yeah. Gosh. But, well, what, what I want to do is push briefly just past buds, but I would ask you, John, if, if we get into other content later and there's something that was like a, a really important experience at buds for you, bring it back up. You know, I know that there, there's a lot more to cover, but yeah. I'm really curious as we transition out of buds, this is one of the things I've thought about a lot with a seal officer. In the army, in the special ops community, you know, you've done some other unit for some time before transitioning into that world, typically. And every officer goes in like to this, to the conventional side, right. straight out of training and has to then lead soldiers who have been doing it for years, especially like even in aviation, people have been doing it since before I was born, literally, you know, like totally different mindset. I would imagine that's even harder in the SEAL community where you've got like battle tested special operators who have been doing it for years and you're this guy fresh out of buds what is the experience like how is the how are you brought on as an officer how hard is that yeah great question and i'm actually glad you mentioned that because there is an aspect right uh that's buds is one of the few training programs that the united states military has where the enlisted and the officers go through the True. exact same True. training right uh, at the exact same time. But yes, you're right. Once you get to the team, you're still a brand new officer most of the time. I mean, unless you laterally transferred later in your career, you're still a brand new officer and you are put in charge of a group. I mean, initially a small group, right? You normally like an assistant officer in charge on AOIC, uh, but you are still a leader in, in amongst the ranks. And I remember I, I was an SDV guy, SEAL delivery vehicle guy. So I had to go down to Panama City after getting my getting pinned as a as a SEAL. Panama City was where the SEAL delivery vehicle training was. So the SDV is a little miniature submersible. And I'm I'm sure you know that, Ryan, but just in case some of your watchers yeah, no, go ahead. You're, yeah. you don't don't know that. It's a miniature submarine essentially, but it's wet. So you're diving in it as it drives. And there was a chief there. <clears throat> so a, a chief is an enlisted rank in the Navy. And he had been in the teams for years. And uh, I remember him texting 
me and another officer in the team, or I'm sorry, in the class saying, hey, meet me here at this time, uh, at this date, and and no no further information. We're like, screw that, man. We've we've got our wives here. It's Panama City. It's Friday night. We're gonna we're gonna go have have fun with our wives. And uh, and the next day we we got called by him. He's like, hey, you need to come see me. And so we we went and saw him. We're like, what's up, chief? He's like, hey, you, you know I'm a chief. I've been in the teams for this this amount of time. When I send you something, it's 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 basically a, an order. You come you come. And you show up at the time I told you to be here. Um, and uh, and that's kind of how it was when we got to the teams. Uh, initially, there's a lot of, hey, you may be an officer, but hey, you're you're a brand FNG, right? A yeah. freaking new guy. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> um, and, and we don't care about your rank. And so uh, the, there's still a level of respect, but there's also a level of, hey, you're brand new. Yeah. So get in line and, and learn from us. And so... Um, the uh, I think that carried carried on until I'd done two platoons. Uh, that my my second platoon, I was an officer in charge. Now um, I had seen combat. Now I had a chief that worked for me, and we were we both worked very closely with one another. We're still very close, good friends. Um, but there was a le- level of mutual respect, right? Yeah. A level of he he saw some of the things that I'd gone through in order to become an officer, in order to become a leader in the teams. I saw him for what he had done already in the teams to be a chief, to be a chief yeah. in the teams. So there's a level of mutual respect there, but it, it does take uh, some proving of your medal uh, still. Damn. Uh, and actually, just before we get into kind of that first combat experience, I'm curious, earlier in the show, you mentioned that you had a bit of an ego. Who do not come off as having an ego? Like, I'm not just saying it, but that's not how I would see it. But I do think you could have uh, many young officers come out of training, especially overcoming something like buds. I would imagine like you got to feel sky high. Yeah. Did, did oh. you, did you really have an ego at that time? Like was it broken later or. <laughs> I, th- I think it got broken in buds. Uh, there were a few things that I struggled with that I, I hadn't anticipated and uh, and that that checked my ego pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, and, and then and then further on in that first platoon, you know, being the new guy, uh, I think uh, I think that ego got checked. Um, I think I've also with age, and I'd lo- I'd love to say wisdom, but definitely definitely with age and time, uh, that ego has been checked in multiple ways. Uh, been checked as a father, right? I, I came in. I only became a father later. Uh, I've got a four-year-old, a two-year-old, and a and a seven-week-old, and I'm 44. So I got started late in the fatherhood game. And I I used to look at my my brothers on on the team who were who were uh, who were fathers, and I was like, and this fatherhood thing looks like cake. I know. Like, oh, I didn't man. say that, but I you know I think it. And then uh, and then I had my own. And I was like, mm, yeah. Uh, Check my ego at the door, right? Check yeah. my ego when when my baby girl, the first time I ever held my baby girl, I'm like, all right, I am I am not as <laughs> I am not as strong and, and hairy and scary as I thought I was. So yeah. Yeah. Oh, man, that's very interesting. I, I felt the same way, like when I was a platoon leader or company commander. I, I was I had a a son when I was a company commander, but he was very young. But certainly as a platoon leader, I just didn't understand how hard life was with kids, like what Mm -hmm. additional burden that puts on you, the family, everything is so much harder. And as a young officer, you just don't, you often don't think about that. And I wish I could go back and just smack myself and say that. (laughs) Same here, man. Same here. Um, And and, you know, that's also another thing I didn't appreciate. Like I was married uh, since divorce and remarried, uh, but I was married and, and, leaving my wife to go on deployment, which that's hard. Don't get me wrong. Leaving your wife to go on a deployment is hard, but leaving your wife and children. I never did that. I never did that on a deployment. And uh, I have a newfound respect for the, the men and women who deploy and leave their children behind yeah. with their husband or wife or spouse or whatever. Um, I, I do have a tremendous amount, amount of newfound respect for that. That's just unbelievable. I can't imagine doing that. No, it's so true. Actually, some of the guys I've talked to now, their kids are have gone into combat themselves, you know, like in the same wild. places they fought. And they, they yeah. were saying that is even harder 
than uh, than being the I, yeah being there and, that, and now that comes full circle back to you know what my dad was saying at the beginning of this conversation yeah. hey my dad telling me that was the biggest mistake of my life and i'm i'm looking at my so again four-year-old daughter sure. two-year-old son and seven-week-old daughter um i'm looking at them and i'm like I hope they never choose combat arms. Right. Not, I would be tremendously proud of them, but I would be in this perpetual fear of, of something happening yeah, to them. So, exactly. Yeah. Oh, man. Well, if we jump into that perpetual fear for your dad, right? Like you go into your first combat environment. Could you tell us just kind of like what the year was? It sounds like you may have been a platoon leader or maybe a, a second in, in charge yeah. in the platoon. But yeah, what, so what did that look was, like for you? It was a uh, pretty unique. Uh, I mean, and, and I sent this to you via email. Is that I, I don't have a whole lot of amazing combat stories, but it, you know, it's my first combat deployment. I got uh, sent out. I was again seal delivery vehicle guy. Their mission is fairly unique, and um, there just didn't happen to be a mission for our platoon at the time that it came time to deploy. So they actually attached us from seal delivery vehicle team two out in little creek virginia and seal team delivery of vehicle team one out in hawaii they attached parts of our platoons to seal team 10 and then seal team 10 they had platoons that went to afghanistan they had platoons that went to iraq they had some platoons that went to germany i got attached to a platoon that went to uh, afghanistan and that was this was in april of 2005 and because of the SEAL delivery vehicle training that we have, those guys primarily focus on surveillance and reconnaissance. So I got sent on a lot of surveillance and reconnaissance missions as a, as a brand new uh, officer, first deployment. Not a lot of firefights in that. It's mostly just keeping eyes on a target for a couple of days, yeah. gathering intel, sending it back. And then, uh, and then later on, there's an assault on that, on that target. Um, <laughs> my my first quote unquote combat was was actually pretty embarrassing. Um, I, I and and th- this this story is fantastic, and it's uh, one I wish I told you to ask me, but I'm just gonna go ahead and jump yeah, into it now. Um, <clears throat> was uh, my buddy at the time? He was in SEAL Team Eight, so I got there. There's normally a c- couple weeks where the two SEAL teams do some turnover. Hey, these these are the targets that we've been looking at. Blah blah blah, and and then. SEAL Team 8 flies home, SEAL Team 10 stays there. Um, he's, he's SEAL Team 8, and uh, he and I are talking about <clears throat> um, this particular mission. He's like, hey, I, I, th- I think you should lead this, this particular uh, combat mission. Um, I jump in a helicopter, and the, the next morning, going on, going into target still before before daylight. Normally, the, the way that we were doing it, we weren't working with the one sixtieth yet. Uh, we were just working with the conventional. Uh, they would fly us in before daylight, but then the the operation would actually happen right at the morning. Um, <clears throat> I had uh, I had pictures on my arms of the various buildings and the bad guys that we were looking for, <laughs> and uh, and we land, and I'm actually in charge, but I'm, I'm the only Navy guy on the helicopter. We have some uh, conventional army that's working with us. We're going to insert, I'm going to run this particular operation over on this location with army guys. And then some, uh, some of the rest of the Navy SEALs are going to come in later and do some other, other, other parts of the operation. Anyway, long story short, we land, we all disembark the helicopter, the helicopter sits there for a second and we run to this wall and I'm like looking at my, my arm to, to look at the targets. It's kind of like the quarterback thing that you have on your arm. Yeah. And I'm like, this looks nothing like any of the buildings that I remember. And I'm flipping through and I'm like, I am, I must be, I must be effed up here. And, uh, and then I look around and I see about a half mile off in the distance, the building that we're supposed to be assaulting. And so I run back onto the helicopter, which hasn't taken off yet. I run back on. I'm like, we are in the wrong location. We're in the wrong location. And, uh, and the, a uh, female pilot is like, I'm sorry, I, I can't insert you anywhere else. This is this is the grid that you gave me, and uh, and oh. and we we end up having this like back and forth right there in the in the helicopter on a combat zone. I'm like, okay, whatever. So I run off the helicopter and we we march to this next compound, um, and then do the assault and everything. It goes down most mostly without issue. I get back after that mission and I am furious. I go go up and I'm like. 
what the F you dropped us in the wrong location. And she shows us the, the GRG, the grid reference yeah. guide. And she shows us how there was some miscalculation. And so bottom line, it, it kind of fell on me that I had, I had messed up, but I was angry, but here's the kicker. So that guy that, that I was, uh, that I'm still buddies with seal team eight guy. Um, he ended up marrying that lady, <laughs> that, that, that no pilot. Way. So years later, we still see one another. And, uh, and she, she kind of snarks at me because I, I messed up, but I kind of snark at her because she could have still seen that the building was not the one we were supposed to assault. Damn. So yeah, that's, that was uh, one of my first combat combat missions. And that's what I look back on. There was no loss of life on it uh, on either side. As a matter of fact, there wasn't a single shot fired on the, on that mission, um, but but uh, it was uh, something that definitely Dang. sticks out in my mind as as one of the more memorable ones. Oh, geez, we yeah. So we did an assault in Afghanistan, and uh, we we were the attack birds, obviously. But the lift aircraft dropped this SF team off like it had to have been a mile and a half in the wrong place, it's and, the worst. and it was on us on this one. It was not on the ground guys, <laughs> and they were. It was so funny when they came back for the debrief. Like they were good sports about it. Everything went yeah. fine on the op, thankfully. But oh man, it was great though because the guy who dropped them off was pretty cocky, and that was an ego <laughs> check for him for yeah. sure. Yeah, man, that's the fog of war. Uh, it is, you know, happens both ways. So yep. dang. And then, so you, you mentioned that you were going in with a with an army team. Um, I yeah. interviewed Tom Shea. I don't know if you. Yeah, he, I know Tom. Tom was one of my instructors at Buds. Oh man, this and he was. A, I think wasn't he a prior ranger as well i think i think Gosh, maybe i'm off i know he did buds five times he said <laughs> i don't I know how the that. hell you can do that but yeah, yeah. so uh, but he was saying he was I, I believe it was him he was saying that he was on an op early on in his career where they were mixed with s with an army sf team and just the coordination was really difficult like how how did maybe since you were the only seal you blended in a little easier but how how difficult was that especially er, that was early in the war yeah yeah it was uh it was early in the war early in my uh my career and I, I definitely hadn't gotten like the training of how to to integrate and you would you would almost think that you're talking to a foreign country wow uh, really like, like just i mean not because it's worse or better it's just different right yeah um they they do things differently or or we do things differently. I have since throughout my career worked with special forces, army green Berets, special forces. Um, and I've worked with the Marines. I've worked with air force and I have since learned to speak quote unquote, speak the, their language and see how they do things. And uh, I actually think many of them do a lot of things better than, than we do as seals. We do certain things better. Um, but I think that some of the planning, some of the uh, coordination by the the army is is or can be better than what I we mean, do yeah. with the navy. I mean, the, the joke is when when you deploy as a SEAL, you're working in a joint environment. And how do you spell joint? A R M Y, army. <laughs> <laughs> True, yeah. I can see that. And, and I mean, you mentioned like that that first mission wasn't crazy no shots fired even the recon missions you were on like pretty quiet I, that's nothing to be scoffed at though i mean like that's probably how you want it to be you're on you're right. doing surveillance you don't want to be detected you're on a, you're doing an assault and you don't have to fire a shot it probably means you planned it pretty well i will right. say we we had a pathfinder contingent with us in afghanistan and we would try to insert them occasionally and we just could never put them in without them being seen like not because of the helos but just blending in is not easy so the yeah. fact that you ran multiple ops, being able to do that is sounds pretty special. It was a lot of fun. I, you know, looking back on it, uh, like I said, looking back on buds was a lot of fun. Looking back on the, the, you know, 72 hour surveillance and reconnaissance missions that we were on, whatever uh, that they were fun looking back on them going through. It's like, uh, that's probably a different answer, but yeah. Um, but yeah, I think you're right. And having no shots fired on a surveillance and reconnaissance mission, that's the way it should be. And ideally, if, if it's not a, you know, a kill mission, which I don't think I've ever been on a kill mission, I've been on capture kill missions. If no shot is fired, that's a, that's a success. Right. Man. And then, I mean, we'll get to the mindfulness piece, but first time you're rolling out, what are you probably like 26? You're going on this, this yeah. recon op where you can't be seen. You're going into a totally foreign place, a very small team, I'd imagine. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
I don't know if you had any of that mindfulness skill set back then, or if this <laughs> influenced it. Like, how, what was the feeling like for you going out on that up? Yeah, the, I mean, the first the first surveillance and reconnaissance mission I ever went on was uh, definitely anxiety inducing. Right, um, you're out there kind of hanging it out uh, without a whole lot of support. Um, even even the surveillance, the the ISR, the the support that we had overhead was was subpar if we had it at all. Um, we we had some unconventional ISRs, sometimes offered by the C-130s that were overhead, but sometimes we had nothing, and we were just hanging it out there. Um, and and there's spots in the mountains where the communication is <laughs> less than great. Sure. Um, so yeah, there was there was definitely some anxiety there. But I had uh, it, on on this deployment, I had a first class petty officer, so an E6, who was uh, super seasoned, um, that that I really relied on to uh, bounce ideas off of, and also you know one on one, I'd just be like, hey, John, I, I, I'll be honest, I'm a, I'm a little scared here. What what should I be Damn. doing? And yeah. and uh, and and he was awesome. I mean, he would he kind of took me under his wing and, and showed me what I should be doing and, and also let me know that what I was feeling was, was perfectly natural um, because going out into the, the middle of nowhere with a small team with very little support, that is not <laughs> perfectly no. natural. So no. yeah. Yeah. That was that. Wow. And correct me if I'm wrong here. Was this a deployment where you, I don't want to say involved in, but were connected with operation red wings. It was. Yeah. So yeah, so SDB Team Two was the the team that I was part of, attached to SEAL Team Ten, and then SDB Team One that was Marcus Luttrell and and Murphy and Axelson and those cats. They had come out from SDB Team One and attached to SEAL Team Ten. And at the time, uh, I was working uh, again the surveillance and reconnaissance missions, and and or I was working in the Joint Operations Center in, in what's called the Siege of Soda. Uh, again, for your viewers, the Combined Joint Special Operations Task Force. So I was sitting at a desk uh, quite a bit. But Murph, Michael Murphy, and I were kind of flip flopping operations, and uh, it, it came down to Operation Red Wings and and the particular area that they were going to do that operation prior the week prior or so. I think they had lost a lot of Marines in that location and. I, I knew it was going to be a risky one. I, I knew that it was, and, and, I, and you know, this is going to sound cowardice almost. I knew that the risk outweighed what we were going to get out of it. I knew that there was a huge risk. And so I, I pushed back on, on that operation. I was like, I don't think Damn. we should be doing this, this operation. Um, I, I certainly don't think we should be doing the way that we were doing it. We were going to send four guys four guys in and, you know, I was going to be one of those. Uh, and, and then Murph and I had that conversation and Murph ended up taking it. And that's, that's where a lot of, uh, where I am now actually yeah. stems from is that Murph took that operation and, and ended up dying on that operation. It's a hero in my eyes and will ever, and will forever be a hero in my eyes. And so are all the other men that we lost in that operation, both on the ground and in the helicopter and both, both the SEALs and the, the Army Night Stalkers uh, that, that we lost on that operation. But uh, yeah, I was, uh, I, I kind of, I don't want to say I turned down that operation, but I was going to be a part of it, ended up not being a part of it. And then was in the Joint Operations Center when all that stuff happened. Um, and I talked, talked to Murphy and, you know, uh, he told me on, on the radio that they were have they they had been compromised. They were having trouble with communication. We were on the Iridium cell phones. And, uh, and then uh, a few hours later, we got the call that they're under fire and then send in the, the quick reaction force and then hear about the, the helicopter. And, and I remember specifically the, the uh, J five. So the, the future operations guys, come onto the, onto the joint operations center floor. And like, I, I heard that there's one of the helicopters is having problems. I heard, heard one of the helicopters is, is having technical or mechanical issues. And, uh, and I called out to the talk, which is even further forward. And they're like, yeah, one of actually one of our helicopters has been shot down. And so that was when we, we knew that, that uh, the ground situation was going to be far worse and get, 
infinitely more complex from there because now we had a recovery operation, recovery of the bodies from the helicopter that we knew had been shot down. And then a, a rescue mission because the, the fate of those guys on the ground was still unknown. So for a few days, we had no idea whether uh, Marcus and Axe and Murph and Danny Dietz were still alive in that, that small little reconnaissance mission. Um, and so basically, I, 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 took, I took whatever I could to stay awake for the next 42, 48 hours, whatever. Um, and, and, then, uh, and then I was told, hey, John, you need, to leave the, you need to leave the job floor. You've been out here too long. And doctor gave me Ambien. I had never, uh, uh, this is where you kind of find humor in a, in a tragic situation. I had never taken Ambien before. And at the time it was these like minuscule ambient pills. Right. And I don't know, I was like 220 pounds at the time. And I was like, these little things are not going to do anything to me. And I'm all amped up from the past couple of days. I'm never going to get to sleep. So I ended up taking like two or three of them. Oh. And oh. Uh, I have no idea, even to this day, Ryan, how I got from the job floor to my bed and my, my wife at the time. So because of what was going on, they, they had shut down the internet um, in the, the, like the regular internet, um, in the, in our camp and in the joint operations center. But I went to this internet cafe that had a, like a coffee shop. That's where I, I would go and I would send emails to my, my then wife. And, uh, she sent me an email that I had sent that night that made absolutely wow. no sense. Somehow I made it from the joint operations center floor to this cafe, logged on, sent an email and then made it back to my bed. Don't remember any of that. How and then she sent me the email <laughs> that I had wow. sent. It was like, wow, this makes no sense. I can't believe I sent this. Jeez. So yeah, anyway, so a little humor and tragedy, but Man. that uh, that next few days, again, rescue and recovery efforts ended up um, finding Marcus Luttrell, lone survivor, uh, ended up eventually finding Danny and Murph's body. Axel since his body wasn't found until a few days later. So now it's like July 4th, something like that. Um, and I was selected to fly back with Danny's body and, and Murph's body. Flew back with them, um, landed in Delaware and, and typical SEALs, right? So <laughs> we're, we're, we fly back on this commercial airliner. Uh, it was not like a, a military airliner, a commercial airliner uh, or commercial cargo carrier and had the caskets in there and and we go in and in plain clothes with our weapons on us we land in delaware and they're like do you have anything to declare i was like do you mean besides the pistol on my belt right here <laughs> right so they had us discharge our weapons there and kind of check them in and we walk through security and, and there's a marine on the other side in full dress and god bless him i, I, I love the marines um, he's in full dress to receive murph and uh and and danny and he's like where are the escorts and we're like where are the escorts and he's like uh the navy gets it wrong every time you guys should be in dress uniform and we're like, dress uniform i didn't even deploy with a dress uniform i don't know what you're talking about <laughs> i mean we have we were unshaven and it's just a mess but um he looked sharp this marine on the other side and did a, a fantastic job of doing the the correct honors uh, of taking care of Danny and, and Murph. And then from there, I, I jumped in my car, a rental car from Delaware, drove back down to Virginia beach. I took the the flag that uh, Danny Dietz's body had been recovered uh, under. So they bring the body back and they put a flag over it, take that flag back to his, his widow. Um, and I spent a couple hours with her. And then from there, I, I drove home to my then wife and I basically acted like nothing had happened. Yeah. And uh, started thinking about the next platoon that I was going to be a part of. Started thinking about the next deployment that I was going to be a part of. Because that's what good SEALs do. That's yeah. or At least that's what in I your mind, thought. Right? Yeah. yeah, that's what was in my mind was good SEALs just charge on. They see what the next ridgeline is, the next mission, and they take that. Um, and I took all the emotions and the trauma and the survivor guilt and boxed it up. And I was like, I'll deal with that later. And later never came because the op tempo in, in the military just doesn't allow you that, uh, special, specifically in special operations, sure. just rolls. So um, 
that's what kind of led me to where I am now, Ryan. I'll, I'll pause there just in case there's anything about all that that you want to ask, and then I'll come. Yeah, I, I don't want to derail you here. I just wanted to mention two things. One is you wrote a, an excellent article about that experience that I read. Um, for I, I found it on LinkedIn, but I'll have a link to it in the description just so people can can read it for themselves. It's really special. Um, I, I think that the other part I just wanted to touch on was just for reference for people, uh, most of the people who watch this show have a pretty strong understanding of the military, but just for those who don't, just a little bit of reference here to be in the, the jock attack, whatever, like that's the nerve center for a, an operation that is run out of there, but effectively like that is the brain of, of the units taking part in, in that theater. So the fact that you should have been on that operation, we're not on it. And then we're literally sitting in there making decisions and, and having to, to watch it play out in real time when it's this tragic is heartbreaking to hear. Like, I just would like to anchor that point just a little bit because that's a pretty significant ask of someone and could probably do some some emotional damage, I would imagine, down the road. So that's all I wanted to say. Please keep Yeah, going. thank you for that. No, and, and you're you're absolutely right. Uh, and I appreciate that. So thank you. Man. And, and sorry, you, you said that you, there was something else you uh, yeah. I didn't want to so, stop you here. No, you're good. Um, so really that that anxiety, that survivor's guilt, all that depression, stress, trauma from that, like I said before, I kind of boxed it up and felt I'll deal with it later. And I never really did. And it caused me um, anger. It caused me frustration. It caused me uh, marriage problems. It caused me um, some self-medication. I, I, I drank a lot. It caused me seeking out spiritual guidance, um, like a lot. It caused, caused a lot. Uh, and not that seeking out spiritual guidance is, is a bad thing. It was just me trying to trying to find ways to heal, but I didn't even know what it was I was trying to heal. I just yeah. knew that I was I I wasn't right. I didn't feel right in where I was. Um, and the the Navy put me on various forms of medication, uh, anti anxiety meds, antidepressants, uh, you name it. I've been on it, and and I think they helped to a point, helped in different ways but also numbed me to any type of enjoyment. I think there's a time and place for antidepressants, anti-anxiety meds. I do personally think they're overprescribed, but that's my, my own personal opinion. But I will say that it numbed me to enjoy anything. Like, sure, it helped with the, the anxiety, the stress, the depression, but it also numbed me to any yeah. type of uh, opportunity to find fulfillment. So in all honesty, I, I started having even worse thoughts than I had without the medication. I started thinking, you know what, this life is not worth living. I don't deserve to be here because better men than me had died on that operation and, uh, and started having some, some suicidal thoughts and went and saw some counselors because of that. And one of them, um, he, he recommended meditation and, and mindfulness to me. And I laughed at him. I was like, uh, what <laughs> meditation? Uh, do I look like a hippie? Um, uh, no. And, and he, he had some patience for me. And that's, this again is where my ego came into play. Uh, definitely the ego came back. Um, he, he said, well, what if I had a pill that I could give you that would improve your performance? that would improve your performance on the battlefield, that would improve your performance off the battlefield, that would improve your performance mentally and physically. I was like, hell yeah, doc, whatever that is, sign me up for that. Because, uh, you know, special operators, that's what we're always looking for is, is an edge, uh, a physical edge, a tactical edge, an edge over the enemy on the battlefield or an, an edge over our, our buddy right next to us. We're always looking for an edge. So I was like, yeah, I'll take whatever you're, <laughs> whatever you're selling. He's like, well, it's, it's meditation and mindfulness. And I was like, ah, you got me. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> Good one. so I, uh, I went back, uh, and I, I typical type a personality. I was like, all right, if this meditation and mindfulness is all he's saying, it's going to be, I'm going to jump right in full bore and jumped into an hour long meditation, 
uh, day one. And, and, you know, within like 30 seconds, my mind is going all over the place. Wasn't paying attention to the guidance anymore. And, and within like five minutes, I'm like, this stuff just doesn't work. I'm frustrated and I'm, I'm just not a person who can meditate. Um, tried a few more times. And after about two weeks, went back to him and I was like, Hey doc, yeah, that meditation stuff that you recommended didn't really work for me. I'm, I'm just not a meditator. And he said, well, that's like going into the gym, getting on the bench press, jumping under 300 pounds without ever having worked up to that. So I was like, okay, yeah, I got you. This guy's good. He's He's good, man. He was so good. So good. Um, so he, he, he said that, um, went back after eating some humble pie, started with some short meditations, went back after two weeks to the doc again. I was like, Hey man, okay. I've, I've done the two minute meditations. I feel some relief immediately after that meditation, but then I get into traffic on the highway. I get cut off by some jerk and I'm instantly back stressed or I'm at work and we're talking about combat operations again. And I'm instantly stressed again. And he's like, well, I'm going to use another gym analogy for you. This is like going to the gym for two weeks and expecting to look like Arnold Schwarzenegger. You can't do that. You've got to work at it. So fast forward another two months after this. So now I'm about two and a half, three months into meditation. And, uh, and I started to notice differences in how I was feeling difference in how I was communicating difference in how I was focused at work. It was, it was amazing. And, uh, and then I was like, okay, yeah, placebo effect is in full time, full effect here. I'm, I'm convincing myself that I should be feeling better. So I'm feeling better. And then I had people come up to me they're like, Hey man, um, what are you on? <laughs> wow. I was like, uh, I'm not on anything. As a matter of fact, I've come off everything. I've come off all the medication but, uh, and I, and I'm starting to feel better. And they're like, well, I, I see that you're, I see that you're, you know, more clear eyed, you, you feel, it looks as though you're feeling better, you're communicating better. And, uh, and they're like, so what are you doing? And there was a part of me that just wants to be like, well, I'm eating better. I'm sleeping better. Cause I was a little, you know, in all honesty, I was a little bit embarrassed to yeah. tell them that I was meditating. <laughs> Um, but then I was like, you know what? I'm just going to tell them. And if, if they, if they listen, that's great. If, if not, whatever. And I expected their eyes to kind of glaze over and then for them to walk away and be like, oh yeah, that McCaskill guy, he's a weirdo. Never talk to him again. Um, but the exact opposite happened. What I had happened almost to a person was, wait, what you're, you're meditating. Well, tell me more about that. And so I would tell people about it. They would go and start practicing. And then, and then we actually started having a small group of people all meditating together and I would lead it and I wasn't qualified. You know, I, all I had was some meditations that I'd gone through and I would just reiterate that. And, uh, and then I sat down with one of my old bosses and uh, he had gotten out of the Navy by, by this point, he was a, a retired Navy captain um, uh, seal. And he was like, Hey, you need to start thinking about what it is you want to do on the outside. Cause he knew that I wanted to get out. He knew that I wanted to retire. Not that I didn't love the job, but it's just time, time for me to be done. Focus on some other things. It's like, you need to start thinking about what it is you want to do on the outside. So I was looking at some of the bright and shiny objects that are out there for retired seals, retired special operators, uh, retired uh, officers. And there's a lot of good work out there. There's a lot. Um, there's, you know, finance, commercial real estate, um, consulting, which I do a little bit of, but none of, nothing really like ignited a passion in me, ignited a fire in me. And, uh, and at the same time, I was still going and, and leading these meditations with these guys. And then I was like, you know what? It's right here. It's right here in front of me. I should do this. And, uh, and I came home and I told my wife, I was like, Hey, uh, <laughs> you're not gonna believe this, but I think I want to be a, a meditation teacher. And she's like, um, are we going to make a living off of that? <laughs> wow. She's like, you know, we have kids, right? Uh, at the time we only had one kid. Um, but I was like, I, I think I can do something with this. Um, and I think I can continue in, in kind of serving my why my why is, is to help others live a fulfilling life. And I think that I can do that. And um, I'll have a retirement to fall back on, which is a nice safety yeah. net. <laughs> yeah. But uh, but yeah, I think I can do something, and uh, that's brought me to to where I am today, doing uh, doing the teaching of mindfulness and meditation, and uh, and then doing it in a whole lot of different realms, um, and and having a lot of fun doing it. But most importantly, I'm I feel at least that I'm making a positive impact on others' lives. 
Wow, man, I got a lot of questions. So first of all, the, the small group that you were leading, was that folks from the teams? It, it, it was uh, not at, at this time. So we should probably back up a little bit. Um, at this time, I had gotten into some trouble in the Navy. Um, so my uh, my daughter had been born. My, my uh, She was... Uh, when she was still in the womb, she'd been identified to have a massive tumor in her liver. And um, we went when she was six months old to get that, that tumor removed at Boston Children's Hospital. And uh, I think I mentioned this in one of the questions that you could have asked me that the most scary thing in my life ever, I, if you're okay, I've been on the battlefield, I've been yelled at, I've been shot at, <laughs> done done this all. Um, the scariest thing ever was my my six month old going under the knife for a 10 hour surgery. She had five eighths of her liver removed, had her gallbladder removed. And we were at Boston children's hospital for, uh, at Boston children's hospital and in and out, both in and out patient for about a month. Terrifying. I com felt completely helpless. And that, that inspired me to put in some paperwork to actually resign from active duty and go into what, what the, the Navy calls, um, uh, oh, wow. <laughs> it's basically the reserve side. I'm yeah. just blanking right now. Um, so basically, it's permanent support, right? So you, you are on active duty, but you're working to enable the reserve side uh, to, to do what they do. Um, so you're, in, you're basically getting them ready to deploy or to mobilize. I forget that what that's called in the army is it inactive reserve or yeah. something like that. Yeah. Ready, inactive um, ready reserve. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we had that and I transferred to that so that I could focus on family. Then I got selected to command a reserve unit and um, the, the reserve unit was out in Salt Lake city and right prior to driving across the country from Virginia beach to Salt Lake city to, to lead this element, to take, to, take command. Um, my sister who lived in Boise, Idaho at the time called me and she told me that she'd been battered by her husband. And so as, and she's an older sister, but I'm still, you know, I'm big, right. Yeah. I'm the big younger brother. Um, so I called this, the husband at the time, basically to tell him if he ever laid another hand on my, my sister that I, I'd kill him. I mean, in, in no, <laughs> no fewer words than that. And, uh, and he didn't answer the phone. So I took it upon myself to send him a barrage of texts telling him what I was going to do, which was a huge mistake. Um, although in hindsight, it, I think it ended up working out for the best. It kind of put me onto a trajectory that I never anticipated myself on. But anyway, um, get out to Salt Lake City. Actually, the day before I drive across the country with my dad, we see all the sites of driving across the country. He's never done a cross country drive. We get out to Moab and I get a call from San Diego saying, you need to be in Salt Lake City today. And this is like a Friday, I think. Um, I'm like, what's this about? They're like, uh, just get to Salt Lake City. So I get to Salt Lake City, show up at the command that I'm going to take charge of the following week. And they've got plane tickets for me. And they're like, you know, okay, from Salt Lake City, you're flying to San Diego tomorrow. I'm like, what the hell? What is going on? And uh, fly out to San Diego stay in San Diego with my next level of command for like two days before they tell me what's going on. And they finally tell me, okay, the Naval Criminal Investigative Service wants to talk to you. You've been brought up on charges of electronic harassment um, because you threatened your brother. Sure, that's one thing, but also because of the training that you have. And I was like, this is so cliche. This is like something out of the movies where it they're is. like, oh, because you're special operations, your hands are like weapons, which is yeah. so not true. Uh, but anyhow, I, I, I messed up. It was my fault. I had threatened another individual, uh, threatened taking his life, honestly, uh, if he laid another hand on my sister. And I did that via text. <laughs> uh, in, in retrospect, I probably should have just driven out to Boise yeah. and <laughs> done something, yeah. but, but uh, I, I didn't. Um, and you know, the, the Navy's hands were tied because if something had gotten out in the news about the Navy SEAL commander threatening this other punk, that uh, you know, it, it would have been ugly. So they relieved me of command uh, before I even took command. They relieved me of my qualification to command, and they sent me uh, straight back to Virginia Beach. 
Um, and so got back to Virginia Beach and they put me in a um, in a, a reserve unit there, actually uh, one of the, the higher echelons of the reserves. And as I'm, uh, this is coming full circle back to your question, but yeah. I had to answer all that just to give some context. So now this is when I'm starting to consider getting out. Got it. And I'm working with a lot of uh, reservists, mostly non-seals. So there's different uh, different uh, branches within the Navy that these p- personnel work in. So there was some administrative folks, some ship drivers, um, combat support. Uh, they all are, are working with me, and, and they're like, they're part of that circle. And they, some of those people that were part of that circle, are still meditating today, and they still let me know that the little circle that we had was life-changing for them. Um, So yeah, they weren't SEALs. Um, I know a lot of SEALs now who do meditate. Uh, It's become uh, become kind of a a mind thing for them prior to getting into uh, onto the battlefield, both to prepare them mentally and then prepare them for subsequently. Um, So uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's good. And it's changing the, the narrative about the practice of meditation and living mindfully is changing. And that's, that's good to see. What, what do you think, I guess, uh, I just want to make sure as people like, certainly they can, they can kind of come to your program, your site. And as they do this, if they're not interacting with you directly, right. Because you've got a lot of people doing this. Um, what are some of the stumbling blocks people might encounter early on? Maybe it's like what you did, right. I, I would assume. Um, <laughs> yeah. But what do I you typically those biggest, see? Those are the biggest ones is, um, you get the, the type A personalities who are, have their to-do list and they're constantly thinking about what to do next. Uh, their minds rarely stop. They tell me, Hey, I'm one of those people who can't meditate. I'm too busy or my mind is too busy. Well, I was one of those people too. The, the, what I tell them is start small and also give yourself some grace. When you do notice your mind has wandered off in a meditation, don't shut the meditation down and be like, Hey, you know what? I can't do this come back to the anchor, whatever that anchor may be. That anchor might be your breath. It might be a body scan. It might be a mantra, whatever that anchor is, just bring it back to that. And don't beat yourself up for your mind wandering. Your mind is supposed to wander. That's what it does. It's like your heart beating. If you try to stop your mind from wandering, it's just like trying to stop your heart from beating. So I think that's one of the things. And then the other one is, I even mentioned it a second ago, is people say they don't have enough time. They don't have enough time. So they're so busy. They've got you know, their to-do list. They've got to get to the gym. They've got to get uh, time with the kids. They've got to get to church, what, whatever. The list is endless, right? Everybody has a busy list. And so they think that they don't have enough time to do this thing that you're not going to see an immediate benefit. Like you might see an immediate benefit, but it's only going to be last, it may only last a couple of minutes. But to see the lasting benefit, it takes two, three months of, of regular practice. And that is what is, uh, is the problem is, is people to see that lasting benefit they've got to put in the time. But then I say to them, and I've seen this myself, that if you practice regularly, you're actually going to be more focused and more productive and more easily, you're going to more easily and more readily, more frequently get into that state of flow. So that if you do have this to-do list that is going to take eight hours to do, it might take seven hours. Yeah. And you're actually gaining some time back. So you get a return on your investment. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, man. I guess if people want to find this, what's the best way to find you for doing this? What is your approach to it? Um, it, it seems like it's there, there's an opportunity for a lot of interaction, which, yeah. which I think you would probably need for something like this. So like, how does somebody find you if they're listening to this? What's yeah. the best way? Well, a couple of ways, uh, you know, I'm on, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm fairly prolific on LinkedIn. I mean, I think that's how we connected yep. originally. Um, and, and I, I try to just share stories about mindfulness, short stories about how to get into it, stories of roadblocks that people may experience and how to overcome those. So I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, I run a podcast called men talking mindfulness. And the, the kind of the point of that podcast is to change the narrative about these practices 
And that's uh, the, the kind of the saying of the podcast is what happens when a, na- a retired Navy SEAL commander and a hippie meditation teacher get together to discuss mindfulness. And that's what happens is we never know. It's completely raw, completely unscripted. I mean, it's, it's a lot of fun, though. We have that men talking mindfulness. And then I work with fer- various organizations. Uh, one is Movement RX with a, a, a retired Marine or not retired, but former Marine, uh, Teresa Larson. We do a, a 21 day mindfulness experience. Uh, I work with My Steady Mind with a, a veteran, Dr. Seth Hickerson. My Steady Mind has a nine week module of teaching this stuff. Um, and then if you're not prepared to do any of that stuff, there's there's a there's all sorts of apps out there. You can do uh, Insight Timer. That's what I started with, Insight Timer. There's Calm, there's Headspace, Waking Up, 10% Happier. I mean, the, the list is endless. Yeah. But uh, I, I, I recommend just getting started. Like, break, like, let the stigma go. Let the stigma about these practices go and try it. Try it out and see how it works for you. Uh, that's, that's what I recommend. That's awesome. Well, I don't want to take up a ton of your time. I've got a few questions that I just go like to it. ask every guest. Um, I do want to ask one from back in your, uh, your, your team days, which is, this might be a two-part question, but All right. I think coming out of, for me, coming out of the army, coming out of the agency, there are a few times where I look back and I was like, man, that one instance when I was doing that, that thing was cool. That's what I thought it was going to be. Not, not what it really was, which was like all the paperwork and the downtime <laughs> and the boredom. But yeah. there are a few moments where I was like, this is the real deal. But what was one of the cooler things you did? in the teams that comes to mind for you? I think still my, one of my favorite things besides leading and working with the incredible caliber of people, men and women that I got an opportunity to do that uh, was, was diving the SDB off the back of a submarine in the middle of the ocean. Right. Uh, and, and, And knowing that that submarine is there in that spot right there, right then to support you and you only as far as you being the team, right? Yeah. The element on that STB. And then when you pull that STB off the back of the submarine and you look down and you know that there is thousands and thousands and thousands of feet of water below you and you have no idea what's below you. That is uh, one of my favorite things. Uh, I remember several operations uh, or training missions that I went on where we would do that, do that both daylight and nighttime. And, uh, and, and you see, other sea creatures flying around like sea lions, uh, you know, dolphins. Uh, I always thought that I would see a shark. I never saw a shark, but I, I think I still think that's one of my absolute favorite things in the, in the teams was the SDV work that I did. Man, you just knocked out two birds with one stone. I was going to ask if it didn't come up, like, have you ever launched off of a sub? Because I just cannot imagine like in the middle of that ocean and the so depths, cool. especially at night, I hadn't even considered that, you know, just, yep. Oh, Jesus. All it right. is, it is my cool. favorite thing, man. <laughs> I love That's it. really cool. Um, all right. Two other questions that I ask everybody. One is, was there anything that you took with you into combat that had sentimental value, was given to you by somebody special, like something that you just kept with you or wanted to have with you during the um, deployment? Yeah. Well, my, my, my first deployment, uh, I, I, I would take a picture of my, my then wife uh, on, on me in, in, in all my combat equipment and I would wrap it in a flag. And then I would take that flag. It w- was not the same flag every time. I would take that flag and send it home to someone and let them know that that flag had been on a combat operation in, in the service of the United States. And that, that was uh, my, my thing. Um, later on, after getting divorced and going on combat operations after that, I, uh, I was not as sentimental uh, as, as, as I had been before. Um, I was still super superstitious. I would still like load my weapon the same way or put my kit on the same way. And I think there's, there's, there's a little bit of the, right. That superstition ties into your being comfortable. Right? Like, okay, you know what? I've been on X number of missions on with this kit and those missions have all been good. And it's because it's because I loaded my kit this way. And it's like, it's not, it's not at all like that, but in your mind, there's some tricks you can play. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you got ball players who do that and they're making millions. Yeah. So uh, right. it works, huh? Yeah. Oh man. Oh, that's interesting. I haven't ever heard somebody say that, that, uh, that superstition aspect. That's cool. Yeah, for sure. And, and then just the last bit here, I think I know the answer to it. You kind of alluded to it earlier, but uh, especially for you with operation red wings, but everything that you went through with the training, 
the loss, um, what you had to deal with along the way, w- would you go back and do that all again? hundred percent, hundred percent. I would, I would do it all, all again. And even, even the things that I regretted, um, in the moment, I think I would do the same way, knowing what I know now, knowing where I am now. And, the uh, you know, I, I'm married to a, a beautiful woman inside and out. Uh, I've got kids that I absolutely adore. I feel that I'm making a positive impact. Um, so I, I think that even some of the things that I originally regretted doing, I, I would probably do it all the same. Unless I, unless I could guarantee I could get back to this exact spot right here, doing what I'm doing right now yeah. with whom I'm doing it um, and still make those changes. But, you know, the old, the old, what is it, butterfly effect? If you change one thing, the whole future changes. Yep. Uh, I don't know if I want to change where I am right now. That's cool. Man, well, thanks very much for the time, John. I really appreciated it. I'll have all the yeah. links in the description here so people can find you, take that first step for mindfulness. Uh, anything else you want to touch on that we may have missed? No, man. I think you've asked some great questions and, uh, and thanks for the opportunity. Thanks for bringing me on. I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, just uh, I'll say farewell and, and have a great weekend. Thanks. You too. I hope you enjoyed this combat story. People often write to me with incredible stories and suggestions for interviews. If you want to share a combat story of your own or from someone you served with, record yourself for up to five minutes and email it to ryan at combatstory.com. I'll select some of these stories and feature them at the end of our episodes. Thanks for listening. Stay safe.